And I'm going to ask for a moment for you to place yourself in one of your favorite natural places from this area. Maybe there's somewhere that you really enjoy going, uh, maybe somewhere in the forest with the trees, maybe somewhere uh, near the ocean, somewhere you enjoy walking, or perhaps somewhere you like to go and sit. I want you to just place yourself in that place for a moment. Go into what you experience, what you smell, what you feel, what you hear. And just have a moment of gratitude for the beauty, perhaps the majesty, the diversity of creatures, the diversity of plant life, Feel that gratitude in your heart and your mind. I've lived many places actually in my life and I have to say that I think this is one of the most beautiful. I think it's good for us to remember to be thankful, to have gratitude and appreciation for the beauty of creation think that helps to move us towards wanting to protect it. As we think about the beautiful land of this area that we're blessed with, I also want to acknowledge some of the history of this land, acknowledge that we gather on the ancestral land of the Lekongan and Saanich peoples. This area here was uh, near uh, a primary village, a place for collecting blue camas, for food and for trade, a place for cultural and spiritual traditions thrived for thousands of years uh, before the arrival of settlers. I want to acknowledge uh, our forebears who cared for this land for all those thousands of years and the ways that they developed a lifestyle that was in harmony with the land. And I want to acknowledge, too, that I'm a white settler on this land and that I and uh, this whole community are walking in a path of reconciliation and seeking ways to live into that reconciliation with integrity. I give thanks in particular for the Songhees Nation, uh, which has uh, been so humble and open-hearted in walking with the Anglican Church in this journey of reconciliation. And give thanks for that and... Uh, for all the grandfathers and grandmothers who, despite a lot of obstacles, have passed down through generation, generations the ways of caring for the land and living in harmony with it. I'm just going to offer a short prayer. Holy One of many names, we give thanks for life, for the beauty of creation, for the opportunity to learn the ways of all of the beings of the earth, the plant beings and the animal beings. We ask for you to be with us as we seek to find ways that we can protect the earth and live in harmony with all the living beings so that all beings can thrive and that the generations that come up after us can also have the opportunity to appreciate the beauty of this place. Amen. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Glennis Verholst is a sustainability planner for the District of Saanich. Um, She's had a lot of experience in energy efficiency, renewable energy, and in climate action uh, programs, uh, particularly in this area. I know one of the things that many of us sort of are questioning at this point is, we know that maybe we need to make individual changes to live in a different way on the earth, but we also need to make changes communally. We need to find ways to live differently in our communities, and we need the help um, of many people in order to do that. Um, And thankfully, the District of Saanich has been doing a lot to focus on climate action. Glennis uh, uh, specializes in in public engagement in this work, and that's why she's here with us today. 
Um, she's uh, managed such programs as the Oil to Heat Pump Incentive Program and the Solar Coalwood Program. Um, she also has a BA in Geography and Environmental Studies and English from the University of Victoria. So she is here to help us understand the Saanich Climate Action Plan and what is being done in this area and how we can be participants and supporters of this work. So without further ado, I ask you to welcome Glenis. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Again, my name is Glennis Verhulst and I am a sustainability planner with the District of Saanich. And I too want to acknowledge um, the, the territories where uh, the District of Saanich um, is located. Uh, and we are at the beginnings of uh, a journey of developing uh, formal relationships with the First Nations whose territories where uh, our municipality lies. So um, the uh, Saanich and Songhees Nations, the Seut, Sartlip, Sakum, Pakwachin, and Malahat nations. And today we are going to be talking about uh, the Saanich Climate Plan, um, uh, which is looking at how we are going to take action as a community, as a municipality, to respond to one of the most urgent issues of our time. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, some climate science, we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, collective solutions. We're going to talk a little bit about what you can do in your lives. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, policies. And uh, I'm going to have a few quizzes for you. And then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So the District of Saanich in 2017 Council set new targets for our community uh, of reaching 100% renewable energy by 2050 both for the district's own operations and uh, for the community at large, residents, businesses. And uh, in August of this year, so quite recently, uh, Council, um, in response to the em climate emergency declaration, um, they also set some interim targets that are in line with the international uh, climate science call to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions very quickly to stay within um, uh, certain levels of rising that we're of temperature rising that we'll talk about soon. So um, we are aiming now as a community to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030 from 2007 levels and then by 100% uh, getting to net zero by 2050. So we're going to talk today about what that pathway can look like and what are some tangible things that we can do right now uh, along that path. Councils also requested us that uh, as we work on the updated climate plan that we look at adapting to a changing climate so that we know that we can be resilient as a community to some new challenges. So basically what we're looking at is how do we get to a renewable future? And this is a picture of an electric bus in the BC Transit fleet. There are already some electric bus trials. Has anybody happened to get on one of these electric buses in Victoria yet? Oh, somebody has. Yeah. So they've trialed a few different ones. We're getting three new electric buses this year. And uh, BC Transit has made a commitment to transition to 100% electric buses. So we've got a lot of um, uh, great uh, momentum going there for getting off of uh, uh, fossil fuels. And by doing so, we're protecting our environment, not just, you know, internationally in terms of our global atmosphere, but also about our local air quality. Um, we know that when we reduce air pollution, we're going to reduce asthma rates in children. Uh, we know that there's lots of different um, uh, health problems that can be exacerbated by exposure to uh, fumes from uh, vehicles. So these electric um, uh, vehicles are going to reduce that, improve our local air quality, improve our community health, and reduce noise pollution as well because they're much quieter. Uh, and we're also going to be supporting clean energy jobs in a diverse economy. So, um, and we're also looking at enhancing community resilience with this plan. So climate change will impact our community. We're going to take a brief look at that, uh, the projections that we have from our local client si climate scientists at UVic. And we can all play a role in improving our community's ability to respond to these new challenges, as we'll talk about today. 
In terms of the development of the climate plan, I don't know if any of you have been following this, but um, we initiated the project in 2017 and we've done two rounds of public engagement. So looking at um, asking people broad questions, what are the barriers to climate action? What are your priorities? What are the co-benefits that you'd like to see from climate action? Uh, and then the second round of engagement was asking people about um, the specific actions that had drafted. Do these meet the mark? Do they miss the mark for you? Uh, and right now, uh, we are just about to enter the third and final phase of public engagement, which is taking a look at the draft plan and getting your feedback on it. So to date, we have engaged thousands of people in Saanich and uh, made a real effort at reaching lots of different kinds of people in Saanich. We rode the bus. Uh, we went to schools uh, and university. We um, uh, talked with stakeholders. Uh, we went to community festivals to reach um, all walks of life. And we found that there was a broad consensus in our community that uh, the vast majority of us have strong support for climate action and a sense of urgency uh, about responding to this challenge and a desire for both regulation and incentives. So uh, in terms of the role of local government, we're, we're hearing that through public engagement. And people were really interested in how climate action can help our health and well-being today and how it can help protect our natural environment. So that's what we've been hearing so far. And we're going to dip briefly into the projected changes for our region from climate change because I want it to make sense why it is that we're proposing the solutions that we are proposing. So let's take a peek. Now this is a little bit of climate science, prepare yourselves. So we've all experienced, this is a bell curve, right, about weather. Weather is different. We've all had really cold years that we've experienced here. We've all had really hot years that we've experienced here. And there's also, the bulk of it is in this normal middle range. So that's weather, it changes, but the climate is really represented by this bell curve and where the bell curve lies. Prepare yourselves for a graph if you don't like science. I will ex explain it. <laughs> so, uh-oh. So what is happening here? So we're looking at, this is um, the temperature from 1950 to 2000. This is, um, you know, the temperature range that we uh, have experienced in the recent past. And then this is projecting out into the future, depending on what we do with our greenhouse gas emissions globally. So in 2015, uh, there was a big international meeting of governments from around the world, and they made certain commitments. So they made a commitment to pursue actions to keep us at uh, up to two degrees Celsius of rise, of temperature rise around the world. And they had a goal of pursuing less than that, so only about 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature rise. And if we pursue business as usual, like we have been doing, and only achieve minor reductions rather than these commitments and these more aspirational goals, this is the line that our climate is projected to follow. So basically, if we meet our Paris uh, 1.5 degrees rise target, this is the temperature um, that we're looking at. This is the climate that we're looking at, this scenario, the blue one. And if we meet the Paris commitments, this is the middle one, that's what we're looking at in terms of our future scenario. And if we pursue business as usual, then we're gonna have a big change. And we have the benefit of having very um, uh, skilled climate scientists right here in our own backyard at the University of Victoria. And they uh, put together a study for the capital region about some projections just for the capital region about what we can expect. And they've, they've looked at what 
some of these scenarios are from recent past, and then what they're projected out to be to, um, between 2041 and 2071, so a little bit into the future. And we see we have a lot fewer freezing days. And that's kind of nice because we don't have to worry about slipping on ice so much. <laughs> but we know we've seen that, for instance, when we have this kind of um, change in freezing days in the interior, that's what's really allowed the pine beetle to proliferate. So there's a lot of things that uh, you know, may, may change in our community based on that change. Uh, we're looking at hottest daytime temperatures going up from 29 degrees to 32 degrees Celsius. You know, that's kind of nice, but it means that maybe instead of going to the lake that you're going to try to find some air conditioning in the hottest part of the afternoon, it changes our recreation. Um, similarly, the, uh, the number of days above 25 degrees Celsius are um, each year are expected to jump from 12 up to 36. And this makes a difference for how our homes cool off at night, right? Because generally, if you open your windows at night, your house will cool down. But if we don't have that, our houses are not currently designed for that level of heat. They design houses differently in Oregon and California and other parts of the world, right? So um, that means that there's some changes for us. We're also expecting some changes in precipitation. So we're expecting to have fewer rainfall events with less rain in the summertime. And we're already pretty dry in the summertime, right? And we're also expecting more intense rainfall events, single events, in the fall, winter, and spring. And this has implications for our stormwater systems, for overland flooding, um, for our, the well-being of our creeks and other waterways, and that kind of thing. And we're also expecting sea level rise. And uh, this is a map that was prepared for the CRD. And we are currently working with the capital region right now to develop more updated maps that will be more complete to help us with better um, uh, data for planning how to respond to sea level rise. And so what does this actually mean with these changes in temperature, right? Well, we've already seen some things in the news that are indicative of what we could see more of in the future. Um, more property damage, costing more for insurance companies, uh, more uh, power outages from, from stronger storms that are happening, um, uh, beaches closed because of um, overflows from wastewater, and um, some changes in seasonal allergies <laughs> as well. You know, there's a, there's a lot of things that, are, that uh, we could see more of in the future because of these changes. And in pursuit of planning for resilience in light of these changes, the District of Saanich has been working with the public and with stakeholders and with an internal staff group to identify what are our biggest vulnerabilities, what are the risks, so that we know that we're focusing our efforts in the right places based on the science. And what we've found out is that um, the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem stress is our biggest vulnerability so far from what we know. And we also know that we have some health impacts from heat and wildfire smoke that we need to uh, look into mitigating. Uh, we're also wondering about, um, uh, we're also looking at inundation uh, of buildings uh, and infrastructure from sea level rise and compromised food production. However, that is also an opportunity for farmers as well as the conditions change. And we've already heard that some farmers are experimenting with crops that they wouldn't normally have grown. So it's a mixed bag for that one because we have more heat. Um, and wildland urban interface fire risk. So those are some things that we are looking in our climate plan to address as a priority. One of the biggest um, challenges that we're facing with climate adaptation is that uh, for some of these things, we have techno fixes. We can improve our infrastructure. We can change our buildings. We can uh, you know, do all sorts of things to make our human lives more comfortable. But it's very difficult um, to, to respond to the challenges of changing temperature and precipitation for our natural wildlife. So this is a 
picture that was taken by one of our environmental services staff um, about uh, drought stressed cedars. So we do expect a lot of that to happen uh, in the future with these changes. And um, our plan does have some responses to this, but it is the biggest challenge for adaptation. And that's looking at what's happening to what's projected to happen within our region. But of course, there's also things that are happening elsewhere around the world from climate change that may have impacts on us because we are not just one community. We are part of a much larger world. So uh, we know that uh, from the UN's reports about climate change that we do expect a lot of challenges uh, for a lot of other people around the globe. And we're very well placed here in Saanich because we are um, a relatively wealthy community compared to the rest of the world. So thinking about how climate change is going to affect others is also something that we can do and take leadership uh, where we can. So this is a quiz. What do you think are the biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions in Saanich? Or, you know, in our region broadly, if you're not from Saanich. Do we have guesses? Yes. Transportation. All right, do we have any other guesses? Industries. Okay, any other guesses? Airline is in and out of the airport. Oh, there we go. Okay. Cruise ships. Yeah. Okay. Well, there we go. We are all on uh, the same sort of track that it's burning of fossil fuels. So you're a very, um, you know, in, uh, informed group. So the way that we count it and there are different ways to count it. Um, gasoline and uh, diesel for vehicles, mainly personal vehicles, are our biggest source of emissions in our community, followed by natural gas and oil for uh, heating our homes. And this is our 2017 community greenhouse gas emissions pie chart. So yes, transportation is the biggest one, uh, followed by buildings, and then waste, which is the way that we're counting it, that is uh, the decomposition of waste in the Heartland landfill that creates methane, which is a greenhouse gas. And some other, which is where industry fits in. And that's the way that we've been counting our greenhouse gas emissions for a while, looking at just what we do inside our community. However, there is a new way um, additionally to look at our greenhouse gas emissions, which also includes the greenhouse gas uh, impacts of the products that we buy and throw away wherever they are made in the world. So when we include that lens in our uh, greenhouse gas inventory for the community, our inventory basically doubles because we're a consuming economy rather than a producing economy. It would be opposite in a community that manufactured products for export around the world. So Still, when we're counting everything that we buy and throw away, transportation is still the biggest at 52%. Buildings are still the second at 20%. But then food at 19% comes in a close third. And consumables and waste uh, it follows up at 9%. So that gives us a few other ways to influence our carbon impact in the world. And before we talk about the solutions going forward, we really have to look back because Senech has a great history of climate action. We had a climate action plan in 2010 um, and a climate adaptation plan in 2011. And we have uh, implemented 86% of the actions in those plans, either um, you know, in an ongoing way or a completed way. So some of the things that we've done is uh, build new bike lanes. I'm sure you've seen lots of them pop up in Saanich since 2010, and uh, as well as new pedestrian infrastructure, safer crosswalks, more sidewalks, etc. And we now have an active transportation plan uh, passed by council last year. Uh, we have made improvements to bus stops with curb cuts to improve accessibility with new um, bus stop um, uh, amenities. We s have a seat on the Transit Commission board, but we don't influence directly the service levels. That's something that's coordinated in the region. But what we do is um, influence uh, how comfortable it is when you wait for the bus and how easy it is for you to cross the street and get there. 
Uh, and we've also installed a lot of um, public electric vehicle charging stations. So we now have two charging stations at the, the municipal hall, at all of our four rec centers, and at our golf course. We have been contributing to rebates for um, heat pump uh, adoption. Uh, heat pumps are, uh, they run on renewable energy, they provide heating and cooling, and uh, they help save on energy bills compared to oil. So they have a lot of um, affordability and resilience as well as uh, renewable energy benefits for our community. And we uh, were the most successful municipality in terms of numbers since 2014. We've had 140 of um, uh, our Senate residents participate in this program. So that's great. And our waste diversion program, if you've been here for a while, you'll remember the time before the greener garbage program. So now we collect uh, organics and uh, like kitchen scraps and yard waste and compost them instead of sending them to the landfill. So um, that's a big improvement in terms of uh, creating greenhouse gas emissions. And we're also doing our best to lead by example. So uh, we have a fleet of electric cars that we share amongst staff. We have solar energy production on the roof at Gordon Head Rec Center and at uh, Saanich Commonwealth Place. And we have at Gordon Head replaced our uh, older gas boilers with a heat pump for the space heating and pool heating. And we just now have a backup boiler that is um, uh, using renewable natural gas. So we've decreased our emissions there. And we recently did some just efficiency improvements at the municipal hall to our heating and ventilation system and reduced our greenhouse gas emissions from that building by 40%. So we're, we're you know, trying to do our part here as well. Oh, and we also have Saanich Commonwealth Place that will be transitioning away from fossil fuels to uh, a biomass boiler that's going to use waste wood for our um, uh, uh, heating needs. So a lot of renewable energy transformations that are happening in our facilities. So despite all of this great efforts, our greenhouse gas emissions have gone up since 2007. And not only have they gone up in our community as a whole, but they have gone up per person as well. So this is not just about our um, uh, you know, community growth, which is very modest. So we have a big challenge ahead of us for our next climate plan to reach um, the targets that we need to do. So now we get to talk about solutions. <laughs> And what we've learned is that we must do it together. There is no way that the municipality on its own with the same jurisdiction, the same powers that we had before, are going to be able to move the dial on climate change just by ourselves. We need to have um, everybody rowing in the same direction, whether that be provincial or federal governments, whether it be neighboring local governments, and whether it be uh, our community organizations, our uh, people in Saanich, um, businesses, etc. We all need to be working towards these targets together. However, we are well positioned for this big challenge. Sustainability is a core value of our community. It's, it's the title of our official community plan. There's strong support for effective climate action in the community, from the district, including amongst staff in all of the different departments that we work with, and renewed provincial and federal commitments. Uh, and we have plenty of, yes, I know, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of asterisks there, right? <laughs> um, and we have plentiful renewable energy where we are. Our, um, uh, and we have market-ready renewable energy technology. And so some of these are different than they were in 2010, right? So we're hoping that all of these things together can get us to where we need to go. First, we're going to talk about our approach in the plan which is first we're going to look at reducing waste, reducing energy waste, reducing consumption waste, so that it's easier to switch to renewables when we have lower energy demand. And uh, we need to plan for resilience as well. So that's the approach that we're taking in our plan. And I'm going to actually ask you what some sources of renewable energy are. 
Any volunteers? Solar, yes, we've heard that a few times. Hydro, yes. Wind, yes. Wave, yes. Biomass, yep, there we go. Geothermal, yeah. Yeah, those are all great suggestions. So that's definitely uh, where we're headed. So in order to reach these targets, we need to move off of these fossil fuels and onto uh, renewable energy. We're lucky that BC Hydro, our electrical grid, we're not on coal, we're not on natural gas. The primary um, last report that we had was it was 98% uh, clean energy as defined by the Provincial Clean Energy Act. So uh, we're luckier than other jurisdictions that way and solar photovoltaics, definitely, solar thermal as well, and biofuels such as renewable natural gas, biomass, biodiesel, all sorts of other things like that. So this is a graph of our pathway to net zero emissions, and I will see if I can talk about it. So it, it looks at, in 2007, how many tons of greenhouse gas emissions that we have all stacked up, um, including waste, transportation, other, and buildings. And then you see they shrink by 50% by 2030, and they shrink to nothing by 2050. And it shows the magnitude of change that needs to happen. And as we can guess, the, the, the biggest change that has to happen is in transportation, followed by buildings. And the other has to do with a bunch of consumable goods. So now we're getting to the exciting part about these are the, some of the, the options that we have available to us. So describing this graph, it's looking at different transportation options that we have to get around to do our daily lives. And it looks at the greenhouse gas emissions that are emitted per person from either um, a 60 kilometer round trip commute or a 15 kilometer round trip commute. And of course, you can see the less you drive, the less your greenhouse gas impact is, of course. Um, and as you fuel switch, and as you get more efficient in your, in your um, uh, transportation options, your greenhouse gases go down. So we can see here that an SUV or a van with a gasoline engine, the bigger your car, the bigger your greenhouse gas emissions are. Uh, a single passenger car that's smaller has slightly smaller greenhouse gas emissions. A hybrid new car really cuts it basically in half. And a new diesel bus uh, has much less than a hybrid single car because you have 20 passengers on it on average all the time. And a new electric car is a smaller greenhouse gas emissions. And a new electric bus is even smaller than that. Not shown here are electric bikes, electric mobility devices, if you are not driving anymore, um, and then cycling and walking. So we have all of these options available to us, right? BC Transit is creating a new electric um, bus strategy and buying electric buses, and uh, we are building out more and more uh, active transportation networks for Senate residents. And uh, we have at least one person in this room who has an electric car, is that right? Yes, does anybody else have an electric car? No, does anybody else get around sometimes by walking or taking the bus? Yeah, there we go. See, you're already doing these great solutions, right? And we know that making the transition to uh, renewable transportation is sometimes difficult. And so these are some of the actions that we're proposing in the plan to help. So we're investing in walking, cycling, and public transit amenities. We're supporting increased affordable electric transit service and transit-oriented development. How close you live to um, you know, a bus stop and uh, how frequent that bus service is. And we're also working to expand access to electric vehicle charging, including for condo owners and renters in apartments. So that's a big challenge right now. If you own your own single family home, it's just up to you to call your electrician. But if you have to coordinate with others, we think that there's some barriers that we'd like to help people address. And in terms of building emissions, uh, we have a lot of uh, sandwich buildings that are still on heating oil. Um, natural gas is the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the residential sector in our community. And you can see 
um, rather than how far you drive, in this case, the, the size of these greenhouse gas emission clouds are based on whether you have an efficient building envelope, so good insulation, good windows, good air sealing, or non-upgraded older homes. So um, efficiency improvements are great. And then fuel switching gets you the rest of the way, um, either to renewable natural gas or to an electric heat pump. And is there anyone here who uses 100% um, renewable natural gas or an electric heat pump in their homes? Oh yeah, there you go. So you can have a conversation with uh, <laughs> your fellow audience members about, about how that works. And this is a Saanich resident named Wendy, uh, who really is enjoying her heat pump because she doesn't have to worry about oil spills into our local creeks and waterways. And we know that this can be a kind of expensive proposition to upgrade your home. So we're looking at providing help with upfront costs of renewable energy upgrades, especially for lower income households in Saanich. We're looking to phase out oil heating in collaboration with the province. Uh, and we're looking to require efficient, low carbon, resilient new construction as well. So those are some of the actions that are in the plan. And in terms of resilience actions, uh, we're looking to expand, connect, and restore natural areas in Saanich, increase the resilience of Saanich's infrastructure, prepare for long-term sea level rise, transition to a climate-ready building stock, deliver workshops for residents and businesses so everyone feels empowered about uh, how to respond to these new challenges, and to support increased local food production from our farmers. And a lot more. <laughs> so our draft plan has over 100 actions in these uh, categories, and I can't go through them all today. But what I'm going to say is that um, you are invited to read the draft plan. It will be available online starting next week. And I will invite you to also take the survey that's going to be available online or in paper and to join the e-news list for upcoming news and events. And if you're wondering about personal actions that you can take, we're encouraging everyone to measure their greenhouse gas emissions right now using the carbon calculator that we have developed that's available on our website. And we encourage you to adopt the same targets. So reducing the carbon emissions in your life by half by 2030 and aiming to get to 100% renewable energy in your life by 2050. And lots of help is available in the form of advice, incentives, and other um, uh, supports that's available to you. Thank you.